choice comes at a cost All the other things are lost No other love can mean so much to me
I believe we can go a little bit farther and say that he is great. God is great. He's totally awesome. You don't need me to tell you. There's living proof that we've seen this morning already behind us. It is great to be a part of that. Miss Crystal has already welcomed our visitors, but if I can, I'd like to welcome you again. It's great to have you with us. I've got some friends here that's come and surprised me um, on invitation of the pastor, and that's great. Um, one that even cuts my hair, and uh, I need another one. And uh, it's good to see you all out here today, all of you. Um, and for you that are visiting with us for the first time, we have in the middle of your bulletin a little pamphlet or a little piece of paper that means much to us here at this church. And if you would, please pull that out. This is our prayer list. And before I go into it, I want to make one announcement before I forget. Uh, Sister Brenda asked me to announce that the July contest for the canned food drive will be over this coming Sunday for July. So please bring anything and everything that you can that is canned next Sunday because people are needing it, okay? So please do that. Now, there's a few names I need to add to the list this morning. We have quite a few families that are out this morning due to travel. We need to pray for them. Uh, Sister Darlene Burke, uh, the Goodson family, Jason and Rhonda. We need to also put on the prayer list Miss Emily Alderman for an unspoken. Miss Diane Ray needs to be added to this list. We need to be in a special prayer from Miss, Mr. Jacob Matthew Shirley, who is a little one that needs our prayer. Okay? We need to add to this also the Hayward family, specifically for salvation. We need to also add every member of every family that was affected in the tragic events in Colorado and also the one that done it, okay? With that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Christ Jesus, again, it is always an honor to be able to come through your Son now and have communion with you. Dear Father, I don't go into it lightly, dear God, because I knew it came at a price. A tremendous price that was given on all our behalves who were in need. Dear Father, I know it joys your heart this morning to see the baptismal pool flow and utter of redemption because of your namesake, Jesus Christ, today. Dear God, what a testimony of faith and of obedience that the ones that came done today. Not only them, dear Father, but the workers, dear Lord, for your purpose. The ones, dear Father, that used the Holy Spirit that was given to them, that planted the seed of the gospel in their heart today. I thank you for those people. Dear God, because it did not go in vain. Dear Father, behind me sat a baby. that witnessed his mother profess the name of Christ today. How beautiful that is. Knowing now that this child will be brought up and reared in a home that fears God. Amen. She has done good this day by bringing him. I thank you, dear God, for all of the families that are here amongst us now, dear Lord, that comes for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to worship your precious name. I thank you, dear God, that you have given us liberty to do that, dear Father. Dear Lord, before me now, we have a list of names, dear God, that have problems in their lives, dear Lord, but those of us who know you know that there is no problem on this list that is greater than you. And I give them to you today. Dear God, I pray especially today for the ones in Colorado who may wake up in a home today that are missing a family member because of an act, dear God, of sin. And that's all it was. Dear God, this act that was taking place in that place to, that the other day, dear Lord, was done because a heart was from you and no other reason. I ask you, dear Christ Jesus, also, as I looked upon the newscast of my leaders 
that none of them, dear God, ever mentioned your name. And that bothers me. It bothers me, dear God, that they sent out letters and notes of compassion and accolades, dear God, from a place, dear God, but never ever mentioned you or their prayers for their families. That disturbs me. But God, today, from this place that you have anointed us with, we bring them to you. And Lord, we know that's more than enough because, dear Father, you said if we had the faith of a mustard seed, dear God, that we could move a mountain. Dear God, your grace is sufficient. We ask you now, dear Father, of the under-shepherd that comes to us today, that you will find no pride within him, dear Father, that you will find his heart pure, that his tongue today will be sharpened by the words, the true inspired words of God, and that it will penetrate a heart today that needs it. Dear God, if there is anything here that becomes a stumbling block to that message getting through, dear Father, I ask you to remove it today in the name of the Son. Dear Lord, bless us today. Holy Spirit, I evoke your presence in this place with us. In the name of the Father, I do speak. Amen. Amen.
Moskva Thank you, Miss Hannah Brown. I appreciate you letting the Lord use you. Wasn't that a blessing? Amen. My goodness. Especially that trump part, you know, that descending part and that trump and blowing part when we check out of here. Amen. amen. Boy, that's the part I like. Check out. Going home to be with my Jesus. Amen. It's been a wonderful day already, hasn't it? Amen. That's right. If you have your Bibles this morning, if you'd open them to the book of Acts, chapter number 8. The book of Acts, chapter number 8. And we'll begin reading at verse 26 and make our way down to verse 35. Story of Philip and the eunuch. Very familiar story to each of you. And I'm not particularly going to preach upon this passage so much, but I want to draw something from it and then grab that by the tail and run with it. And we'll see what happens. Acts chapter 8, verse 26, if you'll stand for the reading of God's Word in God's house. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying... Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch, a great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. I want you to notice there in verse 27 at the end, it said, had come to Jerusalem for to worship and was returning. Now it's after church. He just left church. I want you to get that point. That, that's the part of our text I want you to understand. He just left church. Then the Spirit said unto him, Philip, go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understand thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I accept some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. And the place of the scripture which he read was this. Of course, this is Isaiah 53. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearers, so he opened he, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered and Philip and said, I pray thee of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or some other man. And this is one of my favorite scriptures in all the Bible. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him, who? Jesus. Preached unto him, Jesus. You may be seated. And we must pray together. Father, it's already been a wonderful time in your house. Lord, we've prayed all week. We've we even prayed at daylight this morning here at this altar, God, that you would show up in a mighty and wonderful way. And God, you've done that. You've honored the prayers of your people. And 
And you've been here already. And Father, if we gave the benediction right now, Lord, my heart's so full I can, I can hardly stand it. And Lord, as I looked out at this audience, as Miss Hannah sang, it is well with my soul. Lord, I watched the expression and the tears of the faces of your people. And Lord, for so many, indeed, it is well. For we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. We're winners. Either way this whole world turns out, we're on the winning side because of Calvary. God, I thank you for that. I thank you for the blood that washes away all of our sins. Not one of us here today, without that kind of pardon, would be able to sing these kinds of songs and be in this kind of spirit. So, Lord, you were faithful. You loved us before we loved you. And today, we as your people, we say thank you. Father, we're going to try to preach a little bit. And you know better than me and everyone else. Lord, if you don't help this old boy, we'll leave here worse than we came. I need your help, Father. I need you to just let me forget about myself. Just humble myself. And allow myself to exalt Jesus Christ. Because that is who needs to be seen in this midst today. And I pray, God, that's exactly what would happen. I pray that you remove any distractions. Remove any evil. Nothing allowed in here but thy spirit. And I pray, God, that you would roam up and down the hearts of men, women, boys, and girls. And that you would do your thing in power, Lord, and certainty. God, that lives would be changed. Father, so many times we come at 11 o'clock sharp and we leave at 12 o'clock dull. Lord, so many times we leave church disappointed. And I pray, God, that you'd help us today, Lord, as we teach your word to find satisfaction in you in our worship to find satisfaction in your house, to find satisfaction in our lives and in our ministries. God, today save that soul nearest hell. Thank you that today the baptismal waters stirred, that the day those waters spoke to us and said, there's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh, yes, it's mine. Father, thank you for true Holy Ghost conversions. I pray that you'd bless these folks today as they begin this new walk. Lord, that they'd walk in the marvelous light. God, that you would lead and guide and order the steps. And may they make a difference in this world and lead many to Christ because of you. Father, maybe there's someone here today not saved. Oh, Lord, maybe that call will be made again. Maybe it'll be heard and accepted. That's our prayer. And Father, for... For those who may be indifferent and have gotten away from you. We do that sometimes. We do that. Our little light goes out. And we find ourselves walking in, in the darkness of this world and sin. But Lord, we just keep going. We keep walking. And that light can light again through forgiveness. So Father, whatever work needs to be done, I'm sure there's some... Some disappointed folk in here today, some who are concerned, some who are hurting, some who have sorrows and burdens that they're carrying. And Lord, you said, come unto me all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest, casting all of our cares upon him, for he careth for you. Father, today, whatever the Holy Spirit needs to do to, to get us to a place of satisfaction in Christ, I pray he do it today, regardless of the cost. And that's why I started out to say this. I need you. Speak through these lips of clay now, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We are living in a day, in my opinion, that is somewhat discouraging. And what I mean by that is a day where the church of the living Christ is, is on a decline. We are headed down the road in the wrong direction. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to live in a Muslim nation. I don't want to live in a non-Christian nation. I believe with all of my heart that our forefathers intended that this place, that America, be a Christian nation. I believe that. I know that with all of my heart. And that's the way that you and I should see it and desire it and do our part to make sure that those intentions are fulfilled. You see, we're all a part of the game too. 
I mean, we can't live on the oracles of George Washington, my goodness, and Abraham Lincoln or whoever, whoever these men are who, who did this thing. John Adams, all those guys, you, you took history. I did too, but I just don't remember doing it. <laughs> but you know, what, you know what I'm saying? We've got to do our parts. Listen, the, the, the North American Mission Board recently gave some staggering stats. I gave you one of them in the baptismal pool. But one of the staggering stats that was passed out in 2011 was that 1,000, 1,000, 1,000 Southern Baptist churches closed its doors in 2011. That's alarming. 1,000. And that we've had the least conversions and baptism that we've had in 60 years. We're worse now than we were 60 years ago and folks, we're going backwards. That's alarming to me. I hope it's alarming to you. Because there are probably more than a thousand this year. If we don't change something. If we don't do something different. And then next year and the next year. And God forbid that the church of the living Christ should dissolve. And if it weren't for scriptures that said the gates of hell should not prevail against it. I'd be even more concerned. But there's always been a remnant. And there always will be a remnant who will carry the gospel message and stand for this old book until Jesus Christ comes back. I believe that with all of my heart. So I'm going to say some things today to you that, that, that are just honest. You may not like it, and that's all right. That's all right. I don't like some things either sometimes, but I ain't going to pout about it. I'm just going to say I don't like it and shut up and let's move on. But you can't tell me that. Well, you could, but I'm not going to listen to you. But listen, listen, this is what I find. and this is what, Listen, this is what we deal with. And this is what I see. And I'm being as honest as I know how to be. It seems to me that the, the one thing that Baptists are more concerned about or what they think most about church more than anything else is leaving. It's leaving. It's coming to church, waiting, hoping, looking, in our case, for Brother Will, who gives the benediction. I remember a time when you could come to this church. You'd come in at 11 o'clock. By 11.45, you was in the car heading to town to eat. I can't match that. I hadn't figured that out yet. But I don't understand why we come to church ready to leave. I can't understand why we come to church. And the most important thing when we get here is what we're going to do after we give the benediction. Where are we going to go out to eat? Who are we going to go out to eat with? What is on the menu today? And then what are we going to do after we eat? That seems to be what we're concerned about. Oh, I hear it. Believe me. I don't understand why you get all dressed up. Go take a nice weekend bath. Get all dolled up. Put on some deodorant. Put on some perfume. Ladies put on their face. Comb your hair and get it all right. You got a 15, 20, some people 45 minute drive. You come all the way to church, getting all religious, ready, and pretty to come to church, and you want to get out as soon as you get here. I don't understand that. That don't make no sense. Spend $45 worth of gas and want to be here for 45 minutes and go home. And then, Listen, you spend $45 worth of gas to get here, and you stay all day. I mean, we need to squeeze the Holy Ghost juice out that thing and get all we can get. Gas is high. We need to get, hey, man. Hey, we need to get all we can get. It costs a lot to get here. If you knew the money I spent on makeup around my house, hey, we need to get all we can get out of it when we get here. Say amen, Miss Goff. First Lady Goff, say amen. That's right. But it's a shame. It's, we, we laugh about it. But isn't it a shame that we're more worried about what we're going to eat after church than what, what we're worried about is going to happen in church while we're here? And I'm going to tell you, Brother Corbett comes in here, every, every time I see him, it's like he, it's a broken record. He says the same thing. I'm looking for more. I'm looking for more. I'm looking for a moving of the Holy Ghost. I can tell you what, Brother Corbett, forget it. Forget it. It ain't going to happen. We're going to get fat and sassy, but that ain't going to happen. Not until we change our mentality. 
Not until we change our minds about how we come to church and what we're looking for when we get here. If we was as hungry for the moving of the Holy Ghost as we was to get down to the Golden Corral, amen, we might see a moving of the Holy Ghost. That's good preaching right there. I don't care (laughs) who you are. Listen, the thing that I'm more concerned about than any... Listen, I I know some of you let me know about this thing. It's already 12 o'clock. I ain't even started. And I, and, I, and I know that probably ain't popular. And some people going at 12 o'clock, I don't give a flip. They're going to get up and walk out of here. It don't it matter if it hair lip Jesus. They're going to go. I got, I'll finish in two minutes if y'all want me to. I mean, if y'all don't want to hear no good preaching, I'll, Brother Will, where you at? Hold your hand up. Are you anywhere close by? He left. <laughs> Glory to God. We can have church till Will gets back. Hey, we can have church. To, listen, listen. <laughs> okay. All right. We can preach to Brother Will gets back. So it ain't my fault y'all blaming on Will. But what I'm trying, listen, what I'm trying to tell you, my desire when we come to church, the thing that most concerns me is whether we had a moving of the Holy Ghost of God. What concerns me most is that, the, that you feel like you've been to church, that you feel like something exciting happened. Something amazing happened. Something miraculous happened. Something secular happened. Something Holy Ghost happened in God's house. That's what I'm concerned about. I want you to leave here better than you were when you came in. I want you to leave here charged up. I want you to leave here excited to be an old-time Christian. I want you to be excited that you're saved and on the way to heaven. I want you to be excited that we've got eternal life and the Bible says that we'll never perish. I want you to be excited that the Bible says we have the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. That we're more than conquerors. That we have a home waiting for us. I mean, if that don't excite you, and you know what I'm convinced about, and this hurts my heart, but some people are never going to leave church not disappointed they never are there are some people who just who just never will be able to leave church and not be disappointed and that's what we're talking about today how can we leave church and feel like we've done something feel like we got something feel like the Holy Ghost moved in our hearts how do we do that how Do we do that? We need singing and preaching with Holy Ghost power. That's what we need. That's what we need. And in order for the Holy Ghost to move and stir, we've got to have a desire within us to see it happen. We can't leave here on the market set, go home. We got to come in here with the market set, go Holy Spirit and do your thing. And I don't care if I leave church or not. Amen. We got some old stale uh, 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 communion crackers back here. I'll get Bubba to go get them. We'll pass them out. Y'all can chew on them for a little while. Hey, when Billy Graham preached this great crusade in Britain, critics said of Billy Graham, I don't know if you, if you care about him or what, I don't care. That's not the point. This is the point. That the critics said of him that he set religion back a hundred years. And he so intelligently replied, I wish I could set it back 2,000 years. <laughs> Folks, that's what we need. That's what we need. We need to get back to the old paths. We need to go back 2,000 years ago to an old rugged cross, to an old bloody hillside where the Lamb of God was slain before the foundation of the world. Where the Lamb of God gave His life and He loved you before you even knew who He was. Died for your sins before you were ever born. Listen, that's where we need to go. I had someone, I remember when the church, for some crazy reason, was, was thinking about letting me become the pastor. And someone called me on the phone. It was one of the members, one of the voters and they asked me to come over to the house. And I went over there and I sat at the table with them. I'll never forget it. It was in the evening time. It was, it, it, it was, I can remember sitting around the table. I know just who was there. And this particular person said, I'm going to vote for you on one condition. I said, yes, ma'am, what is it? She said, I'm going to vote for you on one condition. And that is that you promise to visit. Of course, I was very cordial. I was very nice. I said, yes, ma'am. Well, 
I, I, I plan on doing that. I plan to visit as much as I, I possibly can. Of course, at that time, I didn't have any idea what that consisted of. But I thought about it since then. Is that all you're concerned about? Is that I'm going to visit? And see, that's the mentality of so many of us. We don't need to be aquarium keepers. We need to be fishers of men. That's what we need to be. We don't need to be a, a museum of saints. That's not what God intended for the church. We need to be a lighthouse on the hill drawing men to Jesus Christ. That's what the church needs to be. So I want to share four things with you real quick, and I'm done. Four things that I feel like will satisfy us in this thing called church. And I'm just being honest with you. You may not be able to relate to them. I said earlier, some people will never be satisfied. But if you listen to this here, I promise you it will help. And number one, we need to be mission-minded. Look at verses 29 through 35 again. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. Now the Holy Spirit moved on him. He said, Philip, I want you to go. Go over there by that chariot. And the Bible says, Philip ran. Now when the Holy Spirit tells you to do something, you need to do it. And the Holy Spirit is telling you, we need to do something today, and we need to do it. And Philip ran. He ran to him. And he heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understand, is that what thou readest? And he said, How can I accept some man? Listen, he's soul winning. He's on a mission here. He's going to help this eunuch to understand the scriptures. He's going to expound them to him. Help him learn. Help him understand. And the Bible says in verse 35, long story short, that, that Philip preached the scriptures unto him, and he preached unto him Jesus. They got out of church. The Holy Spirit moved. He told Peter to go, listen, I'm, I'm sending you on a mission. You, listen what Romans 10, that if thou shalt confess, listen, the day you got saved, the Bible says we were handed our mission orders. The day you got saved, the day you received Jesus, the Bible says we were given mission orders. You've been given orders, the great commission orders by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That is our commission. A mission of the believer. Listen, whenever we leave here, with our batteries charged, with our hearts full with the joy of the Lord, which is our strength abounding in us, that we go and we share the gospel with others. I know you've heard that. I didn't beat that horse to death. I remember when an another time, during that time when they were going through the, the process of finding a preacher, that there were some doubts about, about me. And understandably so. I, they, I understand that. And, and there were some doubts about different things to do with me. And, and some people would say, why in the world did they give Paul Golf that job? Well, they didn't have no choice. The Holy Ghost lined all that up. They didn't have no choice. Certainly. Certainly anybody would have been more qualified. Why did they give Paul? He don't have a doctorate's degree. That's what they said. I'll never forget old brother C.J. Gulledge. God rest his soul. I'll never forget and appreciate anything more than what he said. He said, oh, we don't need a doctor. We ain't sick. <laughs> <laughs> and I appreciate that from other old. Listen, I don't have anything wrong with doctor degrees. But that isn't the only thing that qualifies a man to be a pastor. I'll tell you what we need in our pulpits today is a man of God. A man of God who's not afraid to tell the truth. A man of God who, listen, he don't give apology for preaching the truth of God's word. He don't preach to men, but rather he preaches for the Lord Jesus Christ himself. You see, here's the problem with this thing is I'm not on your timetable. I'm on his. I can't quit till he says, stop it, Paul, stop it. That's enough. I'm trying to get out of here at 12. I can't do it. 
until he says do it. I don't have a problem with those degrees. I don't have a problem. But we, listen, we need a man of God who will stand and preach Jesus Christ. Number one, we need to be mission-minded. Number two, where Christ is not ignored. And this bothers me today, Brother Ben and Haley, more than anything else in the world. It bothers me with our music. We can find gospel music to sing in our churches that never mention God, never mention the Holy Spirit, and more importantly, they never mention Jesus Christ. They completely ignore Him. That bothers me. I'm afraid of it. And I'm alert to it, and I don't, I don't like it. The Bible says, Philip preached unto him Jesus. Jesus is the theme of the Bible. I don't know how you could preach anywhere in here and not preach Jesus. Because he's in here on every single page. You may not see him, but he's there in type. Or he's there in shadow. You may not see him, but he's there. It's pointing to him. It's revealing him. It's about him. He is the unique theme of the whole Bible. And Jesus said himself in John 5, 39, he said, Search the scriptures, for they are they which testify of me. Now, he said that in John. Now, y'all sleep? No. Oh, amen. He's, I still got a preaching artist. He said that when all he had was Genesis through Malachi, study the scriptures for it is they that testify of me. All he had was Genesis. Oh, Jesus ain't in the Old Testament. Well, he just blew it. Because all he had was Genesis to Malachi. He said, search those scriptures, for it's those scriptures that testify me. He didn't have Matthew through Revelations, you see. So here, I don't understand. If a preacher can't preach Jesus out of his book, he needs to go get a job at Walmart. He don't need to be preaching. God help the crew that ordains that fella. We cannot ignore Jesus. The Muslims say, Allah. God. And it frightens me that on so many Southern Baptist stages that the man of God can say God, he can say man upstairs, he can say Father. Preach a whole 20 minutes and almost say something. Never mention the name Jesus. Never mention Joseph Zuzu said something. Listen. Storms may break. Winds may blow. Pestilence may wreak havoc. Civilizations may totter. Churches may fail. But there's one thing eternal. And that is Jesus Christ is in the world to the end time. And then he made this profound statement that said, The world is not through with Jesus. But it's through without him. The world is not through with Jesus. But it's through without him. Folks, we must preach Jesus Christ. There is no substitute. Number three, where there is submission, there is commission. I was listening to WMHK last week, and there was a quote on there by somebody, I can't remember who it was, who said, said, the hardest mission, the hardest mission in all the world is submission. You know, it takes 30, it takes 34 Southern Baptist professing believers to lead one person to Christ a year. That would be about half this side over here from, I guess, maybe Miss Diane back this way. It'd take that many people right there to lead one person to Christ in a year. That's the average. Ninety-eight percent of professing believers never, ever share their faith. Why? There's no submission to the commission. We know it. Y'all could probably quote it better than I do. Go into all the world. You could quote it. But that verse does us no good until we submit to it, until we carry it out. Does it? 
And so that was given to every one of us. From A to Z. Every one of us was given that commission. Are we going to submit to it or not? Yesterday I was back here with the kids. And I gave a little devotion to, to some of the children that, that were back here. And I told them a little story. And it was about a little girl who was going rock climbing. And the little girl had never been rock, rock climbing before. But all her, all her friends were going. So she, she felt like she needed to go and be a part of that. And so they get there, and she straps up, gets all her equipment on, and off they go, climbing up a mountain. Never been there before, scared to death. And they get about halfway up, and of course, I, I think that's probably kind of tiring. I've never done it, but it looks awful. I might get two foot off the ground, and, and, I, and I, that would be my peak. But they get halfway up, and they, stop, they decide to stop for a little breather, and when they do, one of the girls' rope snaps, and it springs back and hits her in the eye, and it knocks out her contact lens. She can't see. How many of you wear contact lens? What, Bubba, I know you can't see nothing without them, can you? Not nothing. Lose one of them, you kind of half caught. You, it's blurry, ain't it? It ain't right. Well, there she is. Hundreds of feet of rock above her. Hundreds of feet of cliff below her. And, she, and it's blurry. And she's hundreds of miles away from home. She's scared. She can't see. She's hanging up there between heaven and earth and can't see, sister. And she thought about praying. Boy, that's always a good thing to do when you're hanging on the cliff somewhere. Just to let you know. Just saying. And she said, Father, I need your help. I can't see. I'm going to ask everyone to be still as much as possible. There's a lot of movement going on that's distracting. Try to be still, okay? But she prays and she says, Father, I need your help. I'm scared. I can't see. And I need you to help me. She remembered the verse of Scripture. She quoted it. That said, the eyes of the Lord go to and fro upon the earth. And she said, Lord, I know that you can see every leaf on this ledge. I know you know every rock on this ledge. And I know you know where my contact is. And I want you to help me find it. Well, they went on up the rest of the way, got to the top of the cliff. All the little girls and boys are looking all over her equipment, looking all over, looking around, trying to find this contact. They can't find it. So have, they have to make their way all the way back down. And they get down to the bottom of that cliff. And there's a new group coming in who's about to go up that cliff. And as they're passing by this new group, one of the little girls in the new group said, Hey, did somebody lose the contact lens? All the way back down to the bottom of the mountain. And if that wasn't miraculous enough, the thing that was more miraculous was that the way they found it was there was this little ant that had picked up that big old contact lens. <laughs> and he's walking across the face of a rock, and the sun beams down on it, and it glitters, and the little girl saw the glitter, and that's what caught her eye. She said, hey, that's a contact lens. And so the little girl who lost her contact lens later on, her father's a cartoonist, and he draws a cartoon of this little ant, and he's going across a big old rock, and he's toting that big old contact lens like that right there. And in the caption of that, of that drawing, the ant is saying, Lord, I don't know why you want me to carry this thing. I can't eat it. And it's awfully heavy. But Lord, if this is what you want me to do, I'll do it. And I thought, you know, there's a lot of things that different one of us has to carry. Some of us have to carry burdens. We don't know why. We don't know why that happened to me. Why do I have to go through this? Why is God putting this on me? Some of us have to carry burdens. Some of us have to carry responsibilities. Some of us have to carry responsibilities of ministry. Like Christian and Sister Monica. I'm sure there are days they would rather be having a manicure. Or pedicure. Or massage. And they're on a raggedy bus with no air conditioning and bald tires and the door won't open. Really. But we all carry different things. But here's the point of the whole matter. There's one thing that every one of us have the responsibility of carrying. Carrying. And that is the gospel message. That Jesus Christ loves you. 
that Jesus Christ offers you hope that's out of this world. Getting that message of John 3.16 out is our responsibility. And we should say, Lord, I'm going to carry it. Submission. Doing what God has asked us to do. You and I are here for a reason, whether we realize it or not, whether we remember it or not. We are here for a reason. God expects submission. There's some little kids in here. I, 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 I debated about telling this story, but I, I think I need to tell it. Because, folks, this, we're right in the heart of this. We're right in the heart of this, and I hope these kids don't understand what I'm telling. But, but Bailey Smith tells this story sometimes. He had a friend who worked in a florist. And on a particular day, there was a prostitute there in town, an own prostitute there in town, who came into the florist. Of course, everybody knew who she was, what she did. And so the florist kind of bashful. You know, he saw her come in, and he kind of staring at her. You know, he's kind of looking out the corner of his eye, and she looks over, and she's staring at him. He looks back down at his flowers, and he goes, and then he, and then he looks over again, and he starts staring at her again, and she looks up and sees him, and he starts staring back down at his flowers. And he said, Brother Bailey, you ain't going to believe what I did. I walked right over there to that prostitute. I walked right over to that prostitute, and I said, Ma'am, would you like to come to church with me? She said, Sir, do you not know that I am a prostitute? And that old floor said, oh, that don't matter. We love prostitutes. <laughs> and she said, what did you say? He said, yeah, what did I say? <laughs> that lady didn't come to church that Sunday. But she came the following Sunday. At the end of the service, she walked down the aisle and got saved. And God delivered her from prostitution. Bailey Smith, he preached that sermon. And he said, I was looking down at that prostitute who came to the altar. And he said, when she came down, my wife saw her. She come running down and knelt down beside her. And he said, I was trying to tend to the business of the altar. He said, but I couldn't help but, but listen. And he said, as, as I had an ear tuned in to what my wife was saying and what this prostitute was saying, they were saying the sinner's prayer. And right there she asked the Lord to come in their heart, forgive her of her sins, and to save her. And those two ladies stood up and they hugged one another. The preacher's wife and the prostitute right there in the middle of church hugging one another, crying and sobbing and thanking Jesus for salvation. And, and, and the preacher said, the thought occurred to me that both of those women are standing side by side and one is just as pure as the other one because they've been to Jesus Christ. Folks, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Submission to the commission. It is up to you. We are the only thing standing between a lost person and hell. We are it. We are all they got. And God expects us to submit to him, to submit to the great commission and share. Listen, you say, I'm not a very good talker. Listen, I'm not either. Just tell him what he's done for you. Just testify how Jesus Christ saved you. And that will be enough. Listen, there's a lot of people who are ready to receive the gospel. And you and I need to let this household of faith be an atmosphere so that they can do it. We've got to preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And the fourth thing that we need to do is that the Holy Spirit not be quenched. Amen. Is that the Holy Spirit not be quenched. Quenched. I know you're ready to go. I'll, I'll make this. Listen, I, I'll make this real short. A faith healer could come to town and walk into every hospital we have and heal everybody on a hospital bed. And that still wouldn't be as big a miracle as one person coming to Jesus Christ. Amen. You better believe it. It's still. Listen. The greatest miracle in the world is that someone be saved. Jesus Christ said in John that when I leave, you'll be able to do greater things than I did. We can do greater things than Jesus. 
I don't believe in the context that some people believe it. The way I believe it is the fact that Jesus was limited by his human flesh. He could only be in one place at one time. But when he indwells the believer, he can be in many places at many different times. And we can do more with sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ as a, as a corporate body than he could do by himself because he lives in every one of us. And God expects you and I to share him with everybody else. Do you want the Holy Spirit? You and I need to pray that every time we open these doors at Wedgefield Baptist Church that someone be saved. Leaving church disappointed. Because it's a good chance you came in the wrong spirit to start with. If you came looking for a movement of God, a movement of the Holy Spirit, you won't leave here dissatisfied. You will never leave here dissatisfied. When we go, I want you to go and say, man, we had church today. The Spirit of God moved in his house today. It was amazing. It was wonderful. I want to go tell everybody I know about Jesus Christ. Let's just skip lunch today and go tell others about Jesus. I'm not asking you to do that. I'm just saying. Are you leaving church dissatisfied? Heavenly Father, we ask that you help us to reach those who are listening and those we meet to come from the hedges and highways compelled to come to Wedgefield Baptist Church, not knowing why they're coming, but when they get here, they will not want to leave because they feel the Spirit of the Lord is at work here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.